CIA informants were caught and killed because their behavior became predictable. CIA contacts and informants in China were being killed or imprisoned, and investigators wanted to know why. You've been told the dark web is where you go to disappear, but what if I told you it's one of the most monitored spaces online? In this video, I'm going to show you why most dark web privacy advice is dangerously outdated, how Tor was never meant for casual users, and what actually gets people exposed, even when they do everything right. Welcome back, nerds. I'm Addie. I've spent 15 years in cybersecurity, and I break down cyber threats before they blindside you. This week, I've reverse engineered the mistakes that get people caught, from bad VPN stacking to pattern analysis, to the real reason whistleblower networks collapsed in both Iran and China. And if you're going to touch the dark web, you need to see this first. Why the internet most people use is the least interesting part. Most of what people think of as the internet is just the part built to be seen. This area is searchable, clickable, and designed for visibility. That's the public web, and it's tiny. The vast majority of the internet lives behind authentication walls, stuff like email inboxes, banking dashboards, patient records, and corporate tools. All of that sits in the deep web, which accounts for somewhere between 90 to 99% of the internet's total content. You use it every day, but it's not meant to be indexed. The dark web is built different. It's hidden by design. You need specific tools to access it, like Tor. It makes up less than 1% of the internet, but that 1% attracts a disproportionate amount of attention. Why is that? Because it compresses the kinds of traffic that governments, researchers, and law enforcement are trained to track. That's encrypted services, hidden marketplaces, pseudonymous users, and systems that resist attribution. The dark web is small, but it's heavily monitored. So if it's that visible to the people watching it, how did Tor, a tool built for privacy, end up in the middle of it? Tor was built for people whose lives depended on silence. Tor was developed inside the US Navy during the 1990s. The goal was secure communication for intelligence officers working under active threat. At the time, even encrypted messages could reveal too much. If traffic patterns showed messages consistently leaving from a known embassy or military base, that alone could confirm an operation. The Navy needed a way to move information without exposing location, identity, or intent through metadata. That led to a system where traffic would pass through several independent relays, each only aware of the one before and after. The point wasn't to hide the content, encryption already did that. It was to break the connection between sender and destination. That system became the onion router. The original users were trained to understand operational risk. They already knew what not to reuse. They had procedures in place for avoiding correlation. Those are things like login timing, typing patterns, language reuse, and account hygiene. The software helped, but only if the surrounding behavior didn't give anything else away. When Tor was later made public, the core technology stayed exactly the same, but the threat model didn't. Most people who use Tor today were never taught how to manage their exposure. The assumptions built into the systems no longer hold, so the risk now shifts. What actually happens when people use Tor with no adversary model and no idea what they look like from the outside? The dark web watches how you act and what you install. Tor does one job extremely well. It separates your traffic from your physical location by routing it through multiple relays so the destination can't easily see where the connection originated. That protection stops there. Tor does not alter how you behave online, it does not change how you write, when you log in, how often you return, or what accounts you reuse. Those traits remain stable, unless you actively change them. From an investigative standpoint, that stability is enough. When behavior stays consistent, an IP address becomes optional. Analysts look at timing, regularity, language patterns, posting schedules, and identity overlap across platforms. Correlation replaces interception. This is why most people who lose anonymity were not technically compromised. Their encryption held and routing worked. What failed was the consistency across contexts that were assumed to be separate. Many users expect the network to absorb their mistakes. They continue interacting in the same way they always have, trusting that Tor will smooth over habits it was never designed to address. Anonymity only holds when behavior supports it. Without that alignment, tools simply delay identification rather than prevent it, which makes the next issue unavoidable. If behavior drives exposure, why does so much advice focus on adding more tools instead of changing how people operate? Why stacking privacy tools can actually make you easier to track. 
Some of the most common operational mistakes come from well-meaning advice passed around in forums. One example shows up constantly. Use a VPN with Tor for double protection. At face value, it sounds reasonable. But when you look at how these tools actually interact, the trade-offs become obvious. A VPN forces all your traffic through a single provider. If that provider logs, voluntarily or under legal pressure, your entry point into the Tor network is completely exposed. Even if they claim not to store anything, there are documented cases where no log providers have handed over user data in court. My most viral video actually dives into all the lies surrounding the VPN industry. There are so many of them. There's also a fingerprinting issue. Combining a VPN with Tor plus additional browser tweaks or virtualization layers often creates a user profile that stands out from the default Tor user. You might assume they need content, but investigators looking for patterns just need a setup that only one person is using. Adding tools without understanding how they actually overlap increases the surface area and not your anonymity. It turns what could have been a shared anonymity set into a custom configuration. When systems are actively monitored, the outliers are the ones that capture attention. So if stacking tools without a clear adversary model increases exposure, and most advice doesn't account for that, what's actually protecting people? The CIA informants thought they were safe too. They used encrypted messages, logged into hidden sites over Tor, and trusted the tools provided to them by the government. And they still got exposed. Between 2029 and 2013, something terrifying unfolded inside Iran and China. Let's watch what happened. The uh, FBI uh, uses Tor. The CIA uses Tor. Yeah. I mean, there's an example a while ago where the CIA like rolled their own anonymity design. The idea is you've got a bunch of informants around the world. They set up a web page template. Each informant should make their own fake website. And you can like talk to your CIA people through that fake website. And Iran figured out there's this certain phrase that shows up in all the fake websites because they all use the same template. If you just Google for that phrase, you get a list of all the CIA informants. And Iran found them all and killed them all. And then told China who found them all and killed them all. And oh. the CIA started with, let's learn the lesson of don't use a template for your fake website. But the real lesson is don't roll your own anonymity system and don't be the only user of your anonymity system. You need to have something like Tor in order to be able to have it be safe. Now, this is what pattern analysis actually looks like. It's templates, infrastructure, overlap. Tor hides traffic, but patterns expose people. If trained intelligence agencies can accidentally burn their sources by reusing code, what does that say about casual users reusing tools they found on GitHub? And what happens when those same users assume Tor protects them all the way to the destination? Exit nodes have always been the weakest link. Tor routes your traffic through three encrypted relays, but the final stop in that chain, known as the exit node, is where encryption ends. That's the point where your request leaves the Tor network and enters the regular internet. If the site you're visiting doesn't use HTTPS, the exit node can see everything. That means your login credentials, form data, page contents, pretty much anything not encrypted at the destination becomes visible to whoever is operating that node. Even if the Tor network includes thousands of relays, only a fraction are configured to act as exit nodes. This creates a big bottleneck. A relatively small number of individuals or organizations are responsible for handling a large percentage of outbound traffic. Those exit nodes are frequently monitored by academic researchers observing them for measurement studies, or law enforcement agencies monitoring them during investigations, or security vendors running them to collect threat intelligence. It's documented and entirely legal. Tor was designed to protect how your traffic moves through the network, not what happens after it leaves. Once your request hits the open internet, any weakness at the destination, like missing HTTPS, becomes your exposure point. This raises a larger question. If the most visible part of the network is this vulnerable, what does that imply about the rest of it, especially when multiple groups are observing it at once? The dark web is one of the most monitored spaces online. People often assume that if something isn't indexed, it's invisible. But that doesn't hold up here. The dark web is structured differently, but that doesn't make it invisible. It's actually closely observed. Law enforcement agencies, intelligence groups, academic researchers, and commercial threat intel teams all run infrastructure inside the Tor network. They operate hidden services, crawl marketplaces, scrape forums, fingerprint connections, and monitor exit nodes. Some archive entire sites for long-term behavioral analysis, constantly. When Alpha Bay was taken down, it wasn't because they made a mistake or a leak. The FBI had been inside the system for two years, 
watching how the admins operated, how the money moved, how affiliate networks were managed. They were both logging users and mapping the entire ecosystem. Hansa followed a similar path. Dutch police seized the servers, kept the marketplace running for another month, and logged everything. That included login attempts, PGP keys, private messages, and metadata leaks from users who didn't configure Tor correctly. Academic labs have scanned and mapped the dark web at scale. Some still maintain full-text indexes of Onion sites, both active and defunct. These projects are in the open, peer-reviewed, and publicly documented. The dark web is recognizable because so many people assumed it wasn't being watched. So when you log into a hidden forum or respond to a seller, you might not be speaking to another user. It could be an undercover analyst, an automated crawler, or a law enforcement asset collecting behavior for later. The dark web functions as an archive. Someone is always expanding it. Which leads to a more difficult question. If the environment is this actively monitored, who's actually in a position to use it safely? Tor is right for some people and dangerous for many. Tor is useful, but it was never meant to be simple. For people working under real pressure, like journalists, researchers, whistleblowers, and activists, it can be essential for their work. In other cases, Tor is part of a broader operational plan, and they treat it with the same level of care as any other high-risk tool. But that's not how most people encounter it. A lot of new users find Tor through guides, walkthroughs, social media, and advice threads that make it sound like a secure default. Just something you can run alongside other tools to instantly gain privacy and anonymity. The tool becomes the strategy. And that's where the mismatch begins. Most people using Tor today don't have a defined adversary, and they don't know what their actual risk is or how they'd recognize a compromise if one actually happened. They just know the surface level goal is to stay anonymous. But Tor introduces complexity. You now have to manage a browser that behaves differently, understand how sites load through multiple relays, and maintain discipline across accounts and time zones. That learning curve creates opportunities for mistakes, and the system doesn't warn you when you've made one. There's no alert when your VPN configuration defeats Tor's routing logic. Nothing flags your browser fingerprint as unique. No system message tells you that a file you download still contains embedded metadata, or that your second monitor is revealing too much on a screenshot. This is what makes it risky for low threat users because they're adding complexity they don't know how to manage and assuming the tool handles more than it actually does. Tor is powerful, but it assumes a baseline level of knowledge about identity management, behavior isolation, and what can be inferred from timing and repetition. So if that baseline doesn't exist, what's left to protect the people using it anyway? The problem was never Tor, but how people used it. Tor works. It does exactly what it was designed to do. It bounces your traffic through three encrypted relays, hides your IP, and it creates a temporary anonymous route through a decentralized network. It doesn't prevent behavioral errors, obscure your browser fingerprint, encrypt destination websites, remove metadata from files, stop you from accessing fake sites or honeypots, or tell you when you're being profiled. And it never was supposed to. The problem is that most people hear Tor equals privacy and assume it protects them by default. That misunderstanding or that expectation is what causes real world damage for them. Misusing Tor gets people caught. And that usually happens when someone was told that Tor makes them invisible, when in reality, they just become interesting. The dark web isn't magic, broken, or evil. It's just hostile terrain. If you walk in without a map, don't be surprised when you're the one who gets hunted. If you found this video about the dark web interesting, you'll love learning about the harsh truths about VPNs. I'll see you in that video.